National Geographic has a long, rich history of deepening our connection to the world and its inhabitants. And this Earth Day, they're continuing a legacy of exploration with an awe-inspiring look at the mysterious and beautiful world of Wales. Premiering on Disney Plus April 22nd, the four-part special Secrets of the Wales chronicles the whale way of life and their challenges and triumphs in an ever-changing ocean. Narrated by the amazing Sigourney Weaver, it's a profoundly personal saga, venturing deep into the world of whales to reveal life and love from their perspective. It's executive produced by renowned filmmaker and National Geographic explorer at large, James Cameron, and features acclaimed National Geographic explorer and photographer, Brian Scarry, whose latest work will also be featured in National Geographic magazine and the National Geographic book, Secrets of the Whales, timed to the special. And we're incredibly fortunate to have both of them joining us. But before we get started, let's take a quick look at Secrets of the Whales. Welcome, Brian and Jim. It's an absolute joy to be with you both. Um, Jim, obviously. Hi, hello. Hello. Hello, Brian. Hi. We're connected. We're working together. We're long, old, old friends, ocean friends, uh, making also an amazing series for National Geographic with BBC Studios, Ocean X Media. So mm -hmm. we're talking all the time. Brian, it is a joy to finally meet you. I've been tracking your work for a very long time and being inspired by it in my own work. So this is, for me, a really, really fabulous um, moment. Okay, so going out to film personal stories about whales, that's high risk, high stakes storytelling because it's for real. This isn't in the studio, this is out there in the wilds of the ocean. So I really want to know, and I think everyone wants to know from both of you, Brian, we're going to start with you. Mm. Why? Why take on the challenge of this project? What was it that, it, I mean, it's over daunting, but it obviously won your heart. Yeah, I would say the inspiration for this project really came about for a few reasons, but primarily, you know, I love working with whales and, and dolphins in the ocean. I think they're some of the more engaging species. But for me, over the last decade, I was sort of looking for a way to do a multi-species project where I could um, in, involve ultimate, uh, ultimately various species of whales. And the trick was, well, how would I connect the dots? You know, How do I show connections between them? And after speaking to a number of uh, scientists and reading scientific papers, I settled on this notion of culture with whales. The fact that within genetically identical species, whales are doing things differently, much like humans. They have parenting techniques, they have unique food preferences, they have singing competitions, um, they, they have dialects and isolate themselves by dialects like the neighborhoods of New York perhaps in the turn of the century. So using that, that lens of culture, I thought that maybe we could get people to see the ocean differently. Um, it overtly isn't about conservation, but my hope was that it could have that dividend, that people would come to see these families, these personalities that have empathy and love and do things much like we do. You're right in the sense that, um, you know, the good news was you get to go and do it. And, and then the, the reality sets in and you realize that if you did a Venn diagram of all the things that have to line up to, to tell this story, um, you, you would never probably do it. But But that was sort of the the, the genesis of, of this, this project, Secrets of the Whales. 
And Jim, you are a very, very, very busy man. What, what was it for you? Why did you need to carve out the time to get involved with this? I think it's a subject matter. I mean, I, I certainly, you know, knew, knew Brian through National Geographic. They brought this to our attention that he had, he had brought up this idea of talking about whale culture and, and showed the research and showed the science and said, it's there. We just have to go photograph it. And it's going to take a long time to do it. And it's going to be arduous and all the things that, that Brian, you know, raises his hand to go and to go and do. But it's, it, it was the subject that we could in some way illuminate, you know, how these amazing animals that we all, you know, kind of love and respect, but we don't really know that much uh, about how they interact, what their society is like, what their minds are like, and it takes a lot of very careful observation to do that. And National Geographic is willing to, to fund this three-year expedition. And I want to be very clear up front. You know, Brian does the work. He's the one that's out there front line. I've done front line on my own, on my own stuff. But in a way, the things that I've done have been a couple of months at sea to go film Titanic or the Bismarck or the geothermal vents or the, some of the deep hadal trenches. They're always there. You know, it's like a, it's like an appointment. They're not going to break. Uh, you know, we still have the adversity of the ocean as an environment with, you know, tides and winds and weather and all those things that, but, you know, Brian also has the, the fact that they don't necessarily know where the whales are going to be. So when they get a shot, every time they get a shot and the shots are, are gorgeous, they're, they're, they're beautiful. Um, it's in spite of, it's not because of your effort to go out there and your, your will to make this thing. It's a gift from the ocean. Every one of those shots is a gift from the ocean that the elements lined up, the conditions lined up, the animals showed up. And of course it takes tremendous research and Brian can speak to that much better than I can. Tremendous research to get anything done in the ocean. Because by the way, you're underwater, it's difficult and you need to know where to go and where to be and how to behave and how to approach these animals. And he, he can speak to that a lot, a lot better than I can, but it's, it's the kind of challenging, daunting kind of subject that, that appeals to me. It's also so important for people to understand, you know, and, and for this film to illuminate how these creatures think, how they feel, what their emotion is like, what their society is like, because we won't protect what we don't love. And if I have a goal for this show, it's to get people to fall more in love, even, even more in love with whales due to a, a, a greater illumination of, of who they are and how they behave. And maybe that will lead, as, as Brian says, to the conservation dividend. Like, how do we save them? How do we protect them? As you pointed out, these are very challenging animals. Um, you know, what a lot of people may or may not realize, and, and you certainly know, uh, in underwater photography, we don't have the luxury that our terrestrial counterparts do. I can't sit in a camouflage blind with a 600 millimeter lens and wait for a month for some elusive animal to wander by. We have to get in the water and we can only stay underwater as long as the air supply in our back will last. That if it's a scuba tank, that's in maybe an hour. But but with whales, you're not using scuba. In most cases, you're free diving. So you have to get in the water. You have to get close to these animals. They have to allow you into their world. And you have to do it in, in a minute or two to get the shot. You don't sneak up on a, on a cetacean. It knows you're there even before you've gotten out of the boat. That's you right. know, with its echolocation, with its acoustic sensors yeah. and so on. They not only can see you coming a mile away, they can oh. see inside your body, some of them, you That's know, right. so they probably know more about you than, than you do. So it's all yeah. about, it's all about gaining their trust or at, at least, um, you know, not being threatening in some way. And I'm still astonished at the number of encounters you had with orcas and how scary those things must be coming out of that murky water sometimes, all yeah. grinning teeth like that and and uh, you know you're doing that on like you said on on breath hold dives yeah that must be to talk about that. that's crazy well thanks and you make a good point in fact in in uh, our book that you wrote the forward for secrets of the whales um, i talk about in the norwegian arctic being with orca there and i describe it as being scanned by a supercomputer that mm -hmm. 
that they probably know what I had for dinner last night. They know if I'm sick, if I'm feeling well, they're operating on levels that we fully can't understand, at least not yet. Um, in a place like the Norwegian Arctic, I was documenting them doing their natural feeding behavior, again, showing these feeding strategies, which they've developed unique in the world. Um, the orca in that place are feeding on herring. In the Falkland Islands, they're feeding on elephant seal pups. And in New Zealand, they're feeding on stingrays. stingrays. So they have this international cuisine preference. They've figured out how to, how to go for their ethnic foods that they like to eat. Um, but it's extraordinary to see them work. They're communicating, you know, in the, in the Norwegian Arctic, we're, we're up there at the polar night around the time that the polar night begins. So light levels are extremely low. The sun never gets above the mountain peaks. It's very cold. We're diving in you know, very, very cold water with heavy wetsuits, free diving down sometimes 40 feet, 50 feet, um, and trying to get into that world where they're working cooperatively to create bait balls of herring and then tearing through, slapping the fish with their tail to stun them and then going in and picking them off one at a time. Conversely, more commonly these days, I, I first experienced that in the Norwegian Arctic back in 1994 when that's all they were doing. More often these days, they're hanging out next to commercial fishing boats where they can get a free meal. I, I call it takeout food. They don't have to expend the energy to make dinner. They can just hang out next to one of these commercial boats. And, and as they're bringing back a net full of herring, they're falling out and they're, they're getting an easy meal. But when you're down there, you know, it's one thing when I'm free diving, snorkeling up on the surface, the one uh, rare example where I did put on a tank and went down about 30 feet, all of a sudden their behavior changes very much. Mm -hmm. Now you're on their level and, they see you perhaps as a competitor. No, no threats. I didn't get any threat, but it was clear that, you know, that fish was theirs. Don't even think about going in <laughs> to get them. Uh, we, we actually do have um, a clip. I don't know, Orla, if we want to get to it now or a little bit later, but in New Zealand, I, I had an extraordinary experience with orca that were feeding on stingrays. So um, I can I can talk a little bit about that or we can do it later, I guess, depending oh. on Right, yeah, go okay. on orca, go for it. <laughs> yeah, all right. Well, I was working with Ingrid Visser in New Zealand, who is a, an orca scientist, PhD, studies them there. And what she has found out is that these orca will, will move into shallow mangroves and harbors, very, very shallow water, to the point where you would think they couldn't even physically fit their bodies into the shallow water. And they love to eat stingrays. So they will go in, they will pick up a stingray, they will flip it upside down doing this tonic immobility where it sort of goes to sleep and then go about predating on it, eating it. Well, I jumped in the water this one day, was swimming towards a, an adult female that had one of these stingrays. She was beginning to eat it, but then dropped it on the seafloor where I was swimming. So I went down, I, I knelt down on the, on the seafloor right next to the stingray. She comes around behind my back. I can see this massive, you know, black and white orca coming around uh, uh, to, to get in front of me. And then she just pauses and she looks at the ray, looks at me, looks at the ray, looks at me as if to say, are you gonna eat it? You know, the, in, in the film Sigourney says, you know, it's as if she was um, thinking that I was a skinny orca that needed to be fed. Perhaps mom sees him as an underfed orca who needs to put on some weight. She then, you know, very gently picks it up and sort of pauses for a moment. I was able to get a frame of that. And then she goes off and, and we actually have food sharing. It's not in this particular clip, but with a drone, we were able to get this footage of her with members of her family um, food sharing. And again, these are matrilineal societies. They're led by the older, wiser females of the group that have figured out these techniques. They're the only ones in the world who do it. You know, the ones in Patagonia that are feeding on, on uh, sea lion pups on the beach, they're the only ones in the world that do that strategy. So very, very high degree of cognition, but it is their culture. It's what they do. The thing is, the whales have been out there for a very, 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 very long time. And the ocean has been there for a very long time to support them. They've built these cultures. They've designed these lifestyles. They're tribal. They do their thing in their patch of ocean. Hmm. What we know and what the world is really beginning to get to grips with is their world is changing. And it's changing potentially faster than they can manage to keep up with. So in all of your encounters, in all of the storytelling that you've done through this project, what do you think is a the most telling moment that really gets across this world is changing 
Did, was there something that you saw that you experienced for yourself? Jim, was there something you observed when you were watching it, when you were going through the cuts? And secondly, what are we going to do about it? You know, I, I certainly would say that I've seen it in every example. It's almost impossible to go on dives these days where you don't see it. You know, there's 18 billion pounds of plastic being introduced into the ocean every year. Uh, we've lost half the world's coral reefs. 90% um, of the big fish in the ocean are gone because of overfishing, commercial industrialized overfishing. So all of these things impact these animals. Uh, two, two immediate um, examples come to mind. When I was working with beluga whales in the Canadian Arctic, um, the population that I was working with spend most of the year over near Greenland and then in the summer, when it's light 24 hours a day, they travel through the Northwest Passage and come to a place called Somerset Island in the Canadian High Arctic, where it is their, their beach resort. They come into this shallow estuary system. Uh, the water's a little bit warmer because the, the river water is warmer than the ocean water. And here is where they have their babies. It's a, a, a giant maternity ward with hundreds, thousands of moms and babies and rubbing on the gravel bottom like a giant loofah. But this world is changing rapidly. That, that Northwest Passage is opening up. Uh, Jim certainly knows this very well. Ship traffic is increasing. These are acoustic animals that have for so long, for eons, been essentially in their silent world up there. You know, not totally silent, but not ship traffic. That is changing rapidly and the impacts will be highly damaging and detrimental to those animals. We saw it one day, uh, a, a ship was out in the Northwest Passage and deployed two small little tender boats that came into this region that we were, we were land-based and just two outboard engines made 700 beluga whales stampede out of that estuary and they didn't come back for about a week. Just yeah. the sound of, of, of those. Another example was when I was in the Norwegian Arctic and we saw this funeral procession, I would call it, where there was a family of orca that were moving very deliberately on a very snowy, cold day. It was Thanksgiving Day in the United States, the first time I had been away from my family on Thanksgiving Day. And I got in the water and I was able to see this mother, this female orca carrying her dead baby. And very somber moment, very sad, the, the empathy, the mourning that was clear, uh, clearly uh, being exhibited. And although we didn't do a necropsy, we don't know how that animal died. We do know that a high percentage of orca calves die because of toxicities that are in the mom. There's so many PCBs and heavy metals and, and damaging chemicals in the ocean. Their tissues absorb that and it's in the placenta. They, they, it goes through the umbilical cord and that, that calf often dies because of those high levels of toxicity. So those are just two examples of many of these anthropogenic stresses that are having a, a detrimental impact on, on whales. Jim, what, where, do, where do we go with that? Where do we go with this information, these observations, these stories? What, what can we do? What, what, do you, what are you doing? What's, what's the plan? <laughs> well, you know, as Brian was going through it, I was listing in my head all of the different stressors that we create for these, these animals. You know, the fact that they're predators. So all the toxins that we release into the ocean bioconcentrate up the food chain. And so they concentrate in the fish and so on. And uh, it's inescapable that they're, they're being poisoned by us, that they're being uh, uh, deafened by us or their, their behaviors, all of their, their feeding strategies and mating strategies and reproductive strategies are being, are, are being dismantled by all of this noise from shipping channels and military sonars and all that. And there, there are mass strandings and all these things. It, it's just the inevitable effect of the collision of human technical civilization with the oceans. And, you know, it's something that we, it, it's, it's not gonna just go away. They're gonna continu continue to decline. The right whales are down to about mm -hmm. 300 um, members of the species. Mm -hmm. So they're at the brink of extinction. And we barely understand these, these animals. So I think we have to, as a society, we have to think about doing it better. Um, what does that mean? I think, you know, one of the things that, that is the, one of the greatest stresses on the ocean is really something that people dry, on dry land, thousands of miles from the ocean can change, which is, and I, I, I know you're gonna roll your eyes when I bring this up, but if we just didn't eat meat and dairy, we mm -hmm. could cut our agricultural footprint to about one-tenth of what it is right now. And we're constantly using the oceans as a, as a dumping ground or a toilet, really, mm -hmm. for our agricultural runoff, which has created over 400 dead zones. It disrupts the entire food chain in the ocean. It's affecting 
primary production in the ocean, which then affects the krill, which then affects the, the, uh, the herring and the other uh, fish that the, the big whales feed on and so on. So just how we behave, just how we have our overall footprint as a civilization and as individuals on the planet uh, makes a big difference. Even if we're 1,500 or 2,000 miles from the ocean, it makes a big difference. You know, you look at that orca and you say, not only is it the apex predator of the ocean, it's the apex thinker. You know, it has a brain much larger than ours. And who's to say just because it doesn't build houses and tools and have a smartphone that it's, that it's not smarter than we are. They're certainly a highly cultured, highly intelligent animal. They know enough about us to know that we're interesting and not attack us because they could easily instantly tear us apart. And Brian, you came face to face with these in many different, these animals in many different environments. And one of them brought you a gift of food. That's right. As opposed to thinking of you as food. So yeah. they're, you know, they're quite sophisticated animals. And, and I think about, I don't know if you've, you've probably followed the story of these three um, um, uh, male orcas uh, off the Azores that are attacking mm. yeah. sailboats and, dis and disabling them very intelligently by disabling their rudders. And they've done it 27 times. Mm -hmm. So what are they thinking? Are they starting to get angry? Because we don't want them to be angry. They're very big, oh. powerful, <laughs> fast creatures. But if I were in their shoes or their fins, I'd be angry. Oh. I'd be damn angry. Yeah. That's right. And, and J Jim sums it up perfectly, Orla. I think everything he just said is right on the money, our behavior, the things that we can do. So with Secrets of the Whales, what we're trying to do here is get people to see these animals a little bit differently. You know, there's a multi-billion dollar whale watching industry on planet Earth and people go on boats and they love to see whales breach and they eat a hot dog and go home or they eat a veggie burger even better and go home. Um, and, you know, but how much do we know about their lives? And, and that's what this series is about. It's, it's, it's showing people that they have identity. The first thing a sperm whale says when it meets another sperm whale is, I am from Dominica, or I am from Haiti, or I am from Galapagos. Identity matters, family matters. They, they love their grandmothers, their kids, you know? And I think if we can get folks to see the ocean that way, as a place where these families live, maybe we'll want to protect it more. Maybe we'll care about the runoff uh, and, and the plastic and all the things we're doing. So I think that's the message. Jim, I've got a question for you. When you've gone to, to work underwater, to film underwater, you've inevitably ended up pioneering incredible technology to capture a story. And knowing where we're at now with filming and what we can do now and what we can capture where can you see a gap? Can you see stories that are out there that we can't yet get? But if we could only, are you already kind of brainstorming the next pioneering, I'm going to do this and then we can tell this, this tale? You know, it's interesting. I, I've, you know, I've spent about uh, 15 years building, a, uh, 20 years, building advanced uh, camera and lighting tool sets to go into the, the deep ocean where there's little to no light. And, and light it up. And of course, all of the, you know, that's all a very kind of hubristic approach. It wouldn't work at all for the type of photography that Brian's doing. Um, I love 3D, so we've developed 3D tools. Brian, you should do Secrets yeah. of the Wheels 2 in 3D. Um, yeah. <laughs> talking Absolutely. About but, you know, I mean, it, it's, it's a very daunting and challenging place to film. Um, and I, I can imagine um, a set of tools that might be used for the type of natural history work that Brian does that are more sensitive cameras, less intrusive, extremely quiet systems, maybe very quiet vehicles that use anechoic coatings and things like that so that the, they're less intrusive and, and don't change the behavior of the, the animals that you're studying. But, you know, I've, I've shifted a little bit my, my focus from the, the imagining how we can tell stories better and explore better to imagining how we can understand the ocean much more holistically better. And for that, I think we have to apply, uh, apply artificial intelligence and machine learning uh, to kind of swarm robotic small vehicles that again are, are not intrusive that, that spread out and give us the kind of 
information from the ocean that we get from weather satellites. So you can look at the atmosphere from above and see what it's doing and, and understand the highs and the lows and make predictions on an hourly basis and have Doppler radar and all that. We don't have anything like that in the ocean. We don't have any kind of highly networked, highly distributed way of understanding what the ocean is doing. And we have to monitor it for the health of all the animals in the ocean. We have to know what, how the ocean is responding to our uh, inputs of, of civilization. So that's an area of, of real interest to me for the, for the uh, near future. Okay, <clears throat> one word answer from each of you. You can have three words. Hope for the ocean, hope for its future, feeling gloomy, where are we at? Brian, three words. Uh, uh, how about two, cautiously optimistic. Perfect, Jim. Depressed, but determined. <sighs> nice. All right. It's great. Brian and Jim, thank you so much. Thank you for putting yourselves together and making this project become a reality, become an amazing, amazing story of those secrets of the whales. And let's hope there's much more of this going on and more stories unpacked by the two of you. Thanks. Yeah. Thank, thank you, Orla. Thank you, Jim. A real pleasure. Mm -hmm.